I'm Dr. Kathleen Thomas. I'm a rheumatologist in Indianapolis. Our topic today, how to know if your RA treatment is working, is a discussion that I have many times daily in the office, and I appreciate the opportunity to share it with you. I'd like to provide some background history as context, and then we'll move into the current state of rheumatoid management. Rheumatoid arthritis has been recognized since probably about 1500 BC and has had many different names through the millennia. It was not until 1858 that it was called rheumatoid arthritis. And through the years, we have had many different treatment modalities, some that sound rather cruel or difficult to tolerate compared to even what you go through now. Prior treatments included fasting, bloodletting, leeches, insulin, infusion of blood from pregnant women, and even electroconvulsive therapy. Cortisone was not discovered until 1949, and those of you who have had to take any prednisone for your rheumatoid treatment will appreciate why just the following year, those physicians won the Nobel Prize for medicine. However, early into a new drug, there was a learning curve and they had to use very high doses, up to 100 milligrams, and as you can imagine, that had considerable side effects. So we had to learn how to use prednisone through the years. Aspirin and anti-inflammatories were some of our early medications to help treat symptoms, but we often had to use them to the point of side effects. Gold shots were one of our early treatments. Sulfasalazine, an antibiotic-based medication, and Plaquenil were all some of our early disease-modifying drugs. Methotrexate was actually studied in the 1950s, but it was not FDA-approved until the late 1980s but it quickly became the standard of care and an anchor drug for treating most patients with rheumatoid arthritis. However, early on, it was difficult to use. You had to be hospitalized to start treatment, for example. Nowadays, you're started on methotrexate as soon as you're diagnosed. So things certainly have gotten simpler in treating this disease. And the big advancement was in the late 1990s with the introduction of the biologic medications, which really revolutionized treatment of this disease. We underwent a paradigm shift from pain relief to treatment. However, treatment was not started until damage had accrued, and we would treat to the point of toxicity, for example, ringing in the ears from aspirin, or GI bleeds from the anti-inflammatories. Even in 1976, there is an article in the literature that calls this an untreatable condition. And why is that? It is because we did not have formal tools to assess the disease. Our assessments early on included walking in the room, asking the patient, how are you? Can you open a jar? And we still do that today, and it's important. But our notes would reflect patient doing fine, patient doing fine, hip replacement, patient doing fine, patient doing fine, knee replacement. So as you see, we only had an impressionistic view of each patient. There was nothing that we could manage. We were only describing the progression and the destruction from this disease. There was clearly a need for more specific measurements for objective data to get a handle on each patient with rheumatoid arthritis. And now the American College of Rheumatology recommends six clinical assessment tools. And our target in treating this disease is to treat to low disease activity or remission. I'd like to introduce the concept of treat to target. In this modern era of medicine and very sophisticated treatments for rheumatoid arthritis, this treat to target is a relatively new concept to rheumatology, but not in other chronic diseases such as diabetes and high blood pressure. With treat to target, we want an aggressive treatment strategy with specific clinical goals. For example, patients with diabetes know what their hemoglobin A1C is. Patients with high cholesterol and high blood pressure know their numbers. Now, there is no agreed upon gold standard with rheumatoid arthritis, but a goal of low disease activity or remission. 
I like to joke that if you ask 10 different rheumatologists, you'll get 30 different answers on how you measure or achieve this. Treat target requires information about disease activity based on objective data to accomplish goal-directed therapy. And so, how do we define our goals? When we talk about treatment goals, there are your goals as the patient and the physician provider goals. I'll start with a clinical perspective. When treating rheumatoid arthritis, we have six goals. Reduce signs and symptoms of the disease, prevent disability, improve physical function, prevent or at least minimize toxicity of treatments, prevent comorbidities. These are the things such as pain, fatigue, and depression that are part and parcel of the disease. And finally, to prevent or treat the extra articular manifestations of rheumatoid arthritis. These are things such as the dry eye, dry mouth syndrome, Sjogren's syndrome, that is common in most patients with rheumatoid arthritis. The increased cardiovascular risk that patients with rheumatoid arthritis have and osteoporosis or thinning of the bones. So this gives you an idea of overall disease management, not just treatment of the joints. And from the patient perspective, what are your goals? Perhaps fewer flares, less morning stiffness, decreased fatigue. Patient goals often include continuing to work, continuing to travel, being able to play with our grandchildren, simply get up off the floor, or climb stairs with more ease, staying active in your bowling club, continuing to knit. I love these discussions with my patients because it helps me understand them and it helps us work together as a team to accomplish goals. And so function is always important in setting goals. Goals can be moving targets and so we adjust as needed to achieve specific goals. What I'd like to impart to you is that you have a say in your disease status and management. And this is very different compared to most other chronic diseases. And so communication and assessment of data allows for what we call informed and shared decision making. In the era of biologics, we are able to, to achieve our goal of preventing damage. We have very targeted therapies that can accomplish this, and there are many targets that we can use to tightly treat this disease. So we are early in personalized medicine in treating rheumatoid arthritis. But with this disease, multiple medications are often needed. Many options are available to tailor therapy for each individual patient. There are a lot of considerations when we talk about treatment, and it's important that we're on the same page. We're talking about expensive medications and medications that can be difficult to take. One common question is, how long do I stay on treatment? Well, rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic disease, so we do treat chronically. Each medication has different issues to consider and different side effect profiles. So one medication is not necessarily better than another per se. There's always discussion to be had. Things that we consider in treating each individual patient are age, gender. For example, we know there are some medications that are not preferred to be used in women of childbearing years, smoking, and there are other medical conditions which can affect our choice of therapies. So let's move on to the heart of this topic, assessment. How do I know? that my treatment is working. As mentioned before, the American College of Rheumatology recommends six clinical assessment tools. There is another webinar on this website and I, which explores these tools in depth, and I encourage you to review this. My presentation will be a complement to the other. When we assess rheumatoid arthritis, we need to take a three-pronged approach. We need to understand and assess this disease from a clinical, structural, and molecular standpoint. Our clinical assessment consists of metrics. These encompass the physical exam, your tender and your swollen joints, 
your function, and that is captured in all that silly paperwork that you fill out at every visit, and perhaps some labs, including the inflammatory markers. Our structural assessment is from imaging, and the molecular assessment from biomarkers. So at each visit for assessment, not your flare visits, but your regularly scheduled visits, we look at what does the patient say? What do the lab say? What does the imaging say? And what does the doctor say? With imaging, we have three different modalities, X-ray, MRI, and ultrasound. Each of these has unique features, but limitations. X-rays are flat and one-dimensional, and it takes several years for damage to appear on X-ray, and that's not desirable. MRI provides more than a one-dimensional look, but it is quite expensive and often difficult to get covered. Ultrasound also provides a more than one-dimensional look. It is the standard of care in Europe, it is becoming the standard of care in the United States. However, it requires, requires rather extensive training and there's a great learning curve with using ultrasound. So be assured that if your provider is utilizing ultrasound, they are really ahead of the curve. So we know we have our regular routine monitoring labs, but some specialty labs we can order, uh, we are able to measure methotrexate levels. If there's a question, if your methotrexate is working, we can run a test for that. We can measure antibodies to the TNF inhibitors because if you form antibodies to the TNFs, they will no longer be effective. And we can also measure infliximab levels specifically. Now, our most important advancement in molecular assessment of this disease is the development of the Vectra DA or the Vectra Disease Assessment. This provides us a precise biochemical assessment of disease activity. It is a panel of 12 biomarkers that gives insight into inflammation and clinical disease activity in different compartments of the disease, if you will. So for a rheumatologist, this is rather like a microscope for rheumatoid arthritis. Page one of your Vector DA report is your overall raw score. It gives us a number, and then that is further categorized as low, moderate, or high disease activity. Page two lists the individual markers. Now, page two is not meant to drive therapy. Your Vectra DA score can assess response to therapy. If we make a change in your medications, we expect to see a change in your score. And almost more importantly, the Vectra DA does have the ability to predict who may develop radiographic damage. And that, of course, is important because prevention of damage is one of our big clinical goals. One curious feature of the Vectra DA is for patients who are on tocilizumab or Actemra. Now, your overall score will not be truly reflective of disease control. There are some other new developments in molecular assessment of the disease. We have what is called the IDENT RA panel. This is a diagnostic test for rheumatoid arthritis, but there is some data that it can assess response to the TNF inhibitors. And there are also two new biomarkers that are being studied, which predict response to several different biologic medications. So technology is finally allowing clinical practice to catch up with the technology of the very potent medications that we use. We are able to achieve greater precision or less fuzziness in understanding this disease in each patient. We have much more targeted therapies and we have better tools to assess it, but we're still in the infancy of personalized medicine in treating rheumatoid arthritis. Rheuma is the root of rheumatoid arthritis and that is Greek for something which flows. And our understanding and assessments and treatments are always changing too. What I'd like to emphasize is that you have input in your disease status assessment and treatment. And so good communication is important. I'd encourage you to know your numbers, engage with your data, which allows you to engage in your disease management. I'd like to return to the concept of treat to target. Our last target is cure of this disease. And I am confident that in our lifetime, 
we should achieve that. And so to wrap up, it's important to set expectations, have a plan and an understanding for your treatment, know what your targets are, and assess and reevaluate this as frequently as needed. This is a chronic disease, so it's important to form a good relationship with your provider. And communication is your most powerful tool. I hope that I provided you some clarity and optimism, and I wish you ease and the best health possible.